had the pleasure of sitting down with our 44th President of the United States of America, Barack Hussein Obama. While he was out promoting his health care reform initiative, I requested 30 minutes given the scope and detail of my inquiry. They said I could have 20. 20 minutes. 1,200 seconds. Not a lot of time to question the President about one of the most important events in our nation's history. The following is a transcript of our remarkable discussion. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your demanding schedule. My pleasure. The content of your request seems like something I should have carved out a few minutes for. I should point out that I voted for you, as your promises of hope and change, transparency and accountability, as well as putting government back into the hands of the American people, struck an emotional chord in me that I hadn't felt in quite some time, perhaps ever. I appreciate that, Charlie. The Big Bang Theory? An amazing show. Oh, oh, that's right, two and a half men. Big fan, by the way. That Chuck Lorre's a genius. Sir, I can't imagine when you might find the time to actually watch my show, given the measure of what you inherited. I have a TiVo on Air Force One. Nice break from the traveling press corps. Not to be abrupt to rush you, but you have 19 minutes left. I'll take that as an invitation to cut to the chase. I'm all ears, or so I've been told. Sir. In the very near future, we will be experiencing our first 9-11 anniversary with you as Commander-in-Chief. Yes, a very solemn day for our nation. A day of reflecting, and yet a day of historical consciousness as well. Very much so, sir. Very much so indeed. Now, in researching your position regarding the events of 9-11 and the subsequent investigation that followed, Am I correct to understand that you fully supported and endorsed the findings of the Commission report, otherwise known as the official story? Do I have any reason to, given that we've all seen the same evidence? I really wish that were the case, sir. Are you aware, Mr. President, of the recent stunning revelation that 60% of the 9-11 commissioners have publicly stated that the government agreed not to tell the truth about 9-11, and the Pentagon was engaged in deliberate deception about their response to the attack? I am aware of certain infighting during the course of their tireless and very thorough investigation. Mr. President, it's hard to label this type of friction as infighting or make the irresponsible leap to thorough when the evidence I insisted you examine regarding six of the ten members are statements of fact. No disrespect, Mr. Sheen, but I have to ask, what is it that you seem to be implying with this initial direction of our discussion? I am not implying anything, Mr. President. I'm here to present the facts and see what you plan to do with them. Let me guess. The facts allegedly supported in these claims are in this folder? Good guess, Mr. President. Again, sir, these are not my opinions or assumptions. This is all a matter of public record, reported through mainstream media, painstakingly, fact-checked and verified. You'll notice, sir, on page one of the dossier, dated August of 6 from the Washington Post, that the statements of John Farmer, senior counsel to the 9-11 Commission, his quote stating, I was shocked how different the truth was from the way it was described. <clears throat> mm. He goes on to further state, the Norad Air Defense page told a radically different story from what had been told to us and the public for two years. On page two and three, sir, are the statements as well from Commissioner Co-Chairman Thomas Keene and Lee Hamilton, Commissioners Bob Carey, Timothy Romier, and John Lehman, as well as the statements of Commissioner Max Cleland, an ex-senator from Georgia, who resigned stating, It is a national scandal. This investigation is now compromised. One of these days, we will have to get the full story because the 9-11 issue is so important to America, but this White House wants to cover it up. He also describes President Bush's desire to delay the process as not to damage the 4 re-election bid then suspected deception to the point where they considered referring the matter to the Justice Department for criminal investigation. Mr. President, this information alone is unequivocally grounds for a new investigation. Mistakes were clearly made, but we as a people and a country need to move forward. And it's obvious in our best interest in a democratic society to focus our efforts and resources on the future of this great nation and our ability to protect the American people and our allies from any such attack. Sir, how can we focus on the future when the Commission itself is on record stating that they still do not know the truth? Even if what you state 
can somehow approach an open discussion or debate. I can't speak for or about any decisions certain commission members made during an extremely difficult period. Perhaps you should be interviewing one of them. <laughs> Wait a minute. Don't tell me. I was easier to track down than they were. Not exactly, sir. Let's be honest. You're the President of the United States, the leader of the free world. The buck stops with you. 9-11 has been the pretext for the systematic dismantling of our Constitution and Bill of Rights. Your administration is reading from the same playbook that the Bush administration foisted on America through documented secrecy and deception. Mr. Sheen, I'm having a difficult time sitting here listening to you draw distorted parallels to the Bush and Cheney regime and mine. Mr. President, the parallels are not distorted just because you say they are. Let's get to the facts. You promised to abolish the Patriot Act and then voted to reauthorize it. You pledged to end warrantless wiretapping against the American people and now energetically defend it. You decried the practice of rendition and now continue it. You promised over and over again on the campaign trail that you would end the practice of indefinite detention and instead you have expanded it to permanent detention of the detainees without trial. This far exceeds the outrage of the former administration. Call me crazy, Mr. President, but is this not your record? Mr. Sheen, my staff and I authorized this interview based on the request to discuss 9-11 and deliver some additional information you're convinced I do not previously review. Call me crazy. It appears as though you have blindly wandered off topic. Sir, the examples I just illustrated are a direct result of 9-11. And I'm telling you that we must move forward. We must endure through these dangerous and politically changing years ahead. My president, we cannot move forward with a bottomless warren of unanswered questions surrounding the day and its aftermath. I've read the official report. Every word, every page. Perhaps you should do the same. I have, sir. And so have thousands of family members of victims. And guess what? They have the same questions I do, and probably a lot more. I didn't lose a loved one on that horrific day, Mr. President, and neither did you. But since then, I, along with millions of other Americans, lost something we held true and dear for most of our lives. In this great country of ours, we lost our hope. And I'd like to believe I'm here to restore the hope, to restore confidence in our leaders, in a system that the voting public chose through a peaceful transfer of power. Mr. President, are you aware of the number of days it took to begin the investigation into JFK's assassination? If memory serves, I believe it was two weeks. Close. 17 days to be exact. Are you aware, sir, how long it took to begin the investigation into Pearl Harbor? I would say again. Two weeks? Close again, sir. 11 days to be exact. Are you aware, Mr. President, how long it took to begin the investigation into 9-11? It must have seemed like a very long time for all the grieving families. It was a very long time, Mr. President. 440 days. Roughly 14 months. Does it bother you, Mr. President, that it only took five hours for Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, after the initial attack, to recommend and endorse a full-scale offensive against Iraq? I'm not aware of any such purported claim. I have proof, Mr. President. Along with scores of documents and facts, I'd like you to take a look at. Here. <laughs> I see you came prepared, Charlie. No other way to show up, Mr. President. When in doubt, over-prepare, I always say. Now you sound like the first lady. That's quite a compliment, sir. As you wish. Please continue. Sir, I'd like to direct your attention to the stacks of documents in the folder I just handed you. The first in from the top is entitled Operation Northwoods, a declassified Pentagon plan to stage terror attacks on U.S. soil to be blamed on Cuba as a pretext for war. And I'd like to direct your attention to the fact that the principal draftman of this proposal, this improbable blueprint, was quickly denied a second term as Joint Chief Chairman and sent packing to the European NATO garrison. Thank God his otherworldly ambitions never saw the light of day. I wouldn't be so certain about that, Mr. President. I can easily say the same to you, Charlie. The next document reads, Declassified Stage Provocation. Now, honestly, Mr. President, I wish I was making this stuff up. I'm certain you are familiar with the USS Maine incident, the sinking of Lusitania, which we all know brought us to World War I, and of course, the most famous, the Gulf of Tonkin incident. Of course I'm familiar with these historical events, and I'm aware there's a measure of controversy surrounding them. But to be quite frank with you, it's all ancient history. Mr. President, it has been often said, those who do not know history are doomed to repeat it. And I concede to you, sir, these events are the past. A vastly different world, young man, surrounding a radically desperate state of universal affairs. No argument, sir. I'm merely inviting you to acknowledge some credibility to the pattern for the theme. Case in point, the next document in your folder. It was published by the think tank Project for a New American Century. And it's entitled, Rebuilding America's Defense. And it was written by Dick Cheney and Jeb Bush from the document, sir? Further, the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, this might be likely to be a long one. Mm -hmm. Absence of catastrophic...
and let it go down. Like a new Pearl Harbor. Mm, touche, sir. Your thoughts on this statement, Mr. President? I'm going to call this a blatant case of misjudgment, fueled by an unfortunate milieu of assumptions. For some, the uninformed denial of coincidence. Interesting angle, sir. Nevertheless, Vice President Cheney didn't stop there. In the early 2008 Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Seymour Hersh and MSNBC both reported that Cheney had close to the Pentagon an outrageous plan to have the U.S. Navy create fake Iranian patrol boats to be manned by Navy SEALs, who would then stage an attack on the U.S. destroyers in the Strait of Hormuz. This event was to be blamed on Iran and used as a pretext for war. But does any of this information worry you, Mr. President? Should we just ignore it until these realities can be dismissed years from now by our children and ancient history as well? Of course this information worries me. Yet it's not nearly as worrying as you sitting here today suspiciously implying that 9-11 was somehow allowed to happen or even orchestrated from the inside. Mr. President, I'm not suspiciously implying anything. I'm merely exposing the documents and asking questions that nobody in power will even look at or acknowledge. And as I stated earlier, I voted for you. I believe in your message of hope and change. Mr. President, I have come to you specifically hoping for change. A change in the perception that our government has not yet made itself open and accountable to the people. These are your words, Mr. President, not mine. These lives of thousands were brutally cut short, and those left behind to suffer their infinite pain are with me today, Mr. President. They are with me, in spirit and flesh. And the message we carry will not be silenced anymore by media-fueled mantras insisting how they are supposed to feel. Deciding for them, for eight long years, what can be thought? What can be said? What can be asked? And I appreciate your passion, and I appreciate your conviction. In spite of your concerns, in spite of what your data might or might not reveal, what you and the families must understand and accept is that we are doing everything we can to protect you. Mr. President, I realize we're very short on time, so please allow me to run down a list of bullet points that might illuminate some reasons why we don't embrace the warm hug of federal protection. We've come this far, far away. Please keep in mind, Mr. President, everything I'm about to say is documented as fact and part of the public record. The information you are holding in your hands chronicles and verifies each and every point. You have five minutes left. The floor is yours. Brief me. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay, first, on the FBI's most wanted list, Osama bin Laden is not charged with the crime of 9-11. When I called the FBI to ask them why this was the case, they replied, there's not enough evidence to link bin Laden to the crime scene. I later discovered he had never even been indicted by the DOJ. Number two, FBI translator Sybil Edmonds was dismissed and gagged by the DOJ after she revealed that the government had foreknowledge of plans to attack American cities using planes as bombs as early as April 2001. In July of 2009, Edmonds broke the federal gag order and went public to reveal that Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and the Taliban were all working for the CIA up until the day of 9-11. Number three, the following is a quote from Mayor Giuliani during an interview on 9-11 with Peter Jennings for ABC News. I went down to the scene and we set up headquarters at 75 Berkeley Street, which is right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, and the head of the emergency management. And we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. And it did collapse before we could actually get out of the building. So we were trapped in the building for 10, 15 minutes. And finally, found an exit and got out. Walked north and took a lot of people with us. Who told them this? To this day, the answer to this question remains unanswered. Completely ignored and empathetically denied by Mayor Giuliani on several public occasions. Number four. In April 2004, USA Today reported in the two years before the September 11th attack, the North American Aerospace Defense Command conducted exercises simulating what the White House says was unimaginable at the time hijacked airliners, used as weapons to crash into targets, and caused mass casualties. One of the targets was the World Trade Center. Number five, on September 12, 2007, CNN's Anderson Cooper 360 reported that the mysterious white plane spotted and videotaped by multiple media outlets flying in restricted airspace over the White House shortly before 10 a.m. on the morning of 9-11 was in fact the Air Force E-4B, a specially modified Boeing 747 with a communication pod behind the cockpit, otherwise known as the Doomsday Plane. Though, Fully aware of the events, 9-11 Commission did not deem the appearance of the military plane to be of any interest and did not include it in the final 9-11 Commission report. Number six, three F-16s assigned to Andrews Air Force Base, 10 miles from Washington, D.C., are conducting training exercises in North Carolina, 207 miles away, as the first plane crashes into the World Trade Center, even at significantly less than their top speed of 1,500 miles per hour. They could still have ascended the skies over Washington well before 9 a.m. More than 37 minutes before the flight, 77 crashes into the Pentagon. However, they did not return until 9.55 a.m. Andrews Air Force Base had no armed fighters on alert and ready to take off on the morning of 9-11. Number 7, World Trade Center Building 7. Watch the video. It's collapsed. Number 8, 
Flight 93 is the fourth plane to crash on 9-11 at 10.03 a.m. Vice President Cheney only gives shoot-down order at 10.10 and 10.20 a.m. And this is not communicated to NORAD until 28 minutes after Flight 93 had crashed. Feeling further suspicion on this front is the fact that three months before the attack of 9-11, Dick Cheney usurped control of NORAD, and therefore he, and no one else on planet Earth, had the power to call the military sorties on the hijacked airliners on 9-11. He did not exercise that power. Three months after 9-11, he relinquished command on NORAD and returned it to its military operations. Number nine, scores of mainstream news outlets reported that the FBI conducted an investigation of at least five of the 9-11 hijackers being trained at U.S. military flight schools. Those investigations are now sealed and need to be declassified. Number 10. In 2004, New York firefighters Mike DeLone and Nicholas DeMasi went public to say that they had found the black boxes at the World Trade Center, but were told to keep their mouths shut by FBI agents. Nicholas DeMasi said that he escorted federal agents on an all-terrain vehicle in October 2001 and helped them locate the devices, a story backed up by the rescue volunteers Mike DeLone. As the Philadelphia Daily News reported at the time, their story raised the question of whether there was some type of cover-up at Ground Zero. Number 11. Hundreds of eyewitnesses, including first responders, first captains, news reporters, and police, all described multiple explosions in both towers before and during the collapse. Number 12. An astonishing video uncovered from the archive show BBC News and correspondent Jane Stanley reporting on the collapse of World Trade Center Building 7 over 20 minutes before it fell at 5.20 on the afternoon of 9-11. Tapes from earlier BBC broadcasts showed news anchors discussing class of World Trade Center 7, a full 26 minutes in advance. The BBC at first claimed that their tapes from 9-11 had been lost, before admitting that they made the error of reporting the collapse of World Trade Center 7 before it happened without adequately explaining how they could have obtained advanced knowledge of the event. In addition, over an hour before the collapse of World Trade Center 7, at 4.10 p.m., CNN's Aaron Brown reported that the building has either collapsed or is collapsing. Number 13. Solicitor General Ted Olson's claim that his wife, Barbara Olson, called him twice from Flight 77, describing hijackers with box cutters, was a central plank of the official 9-11 story. However, the credibility of the story was completely undermined after Olson's kept changing his story about whether his wife used his cell phone or airplane phone. The technology to enable cell phone calls from high-altitude airline flights was not created until 2004. American Airlines confirmed that Flight 77 was a Boeing 757 and that this plane did not have airplane phones on board. According to FBI, Barbara Olson's attempt to call her husband only once and the cell phone failed to connect. Therefore, Olson must have been lying when he claimed that he had spoken to his wife from Flight 77. Number 14. The size of the Boeing 757 is approximately 125 feet in width, and yet, images of the impact zone at the Pentagon supposedly caused by the crash merely shows a hole no more than 16 feet in diameter. The engines of the 757 would have punctured a hole bigger than this, never mind the whole thing. Images before that partial collapse of the impact zone show little real impact damage and a sparse debris field completely inconsistent with the crash of the larger jetliner, especially when contrast with the other images showing airplane crashes into the building. Number 15, what is the meaning behind the following quote attributed to Dick Cheney which came to light during 9-11 commission hearings? The passage is taken from testimony given by the Secretary of Transport, Norman Mineta. During the time that the airplane was coming in to the Pentagon, there was a young man who would come in and say to the President, the plane is 50 miles out. The plane is 30 miles out. And when it got down to the plane is 10 miles out, the young man also said to the Vice President, do the orders still stand? And the Vice President turned and whipped his neck around, of course, the orders still stand. Have you heard anything to the contrary? As the plane was not shot down, in addition to the fact that armed fire jets were nowhere near the plane and the Pentagon defense system was not activated, are we to take it that the orders were to let the planes find its target? Number 16, in May 2003, the Miami Herald reported how the Bush administration was refusing to release a 900-page congressional report on 9-11 because it wanted to avoid enshrining embarrassing details in the report, particularly regarding a pre-9-11 warning as well as the fact that the hijackers were trained at U.S. flight schools. Number 17, top Pentagon officials canceled their scheduled flights for September 11th on September 10th. San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown, following a security warning, canceled a flight into New York that was scheduled for the morning of 9-11. Number 18. The technology to enable cell phone calls from the high-altitude airline flight was not created until 2004, and even by that point, it was only in the trial phase. Calls from cell phones were formed an integral part of the official government version of events, were technologically impossible at the time. Number 19. On April 29, 2004, President Bush and Vice President Cheney would only meet with the commission under specific clandestine conditions. 
they insisted on testifying not under oath. They also demanded that their testimony be treated as a matter of state secret. To date, nothing they spoke of that they exist in public domain. And finally, Mr. President, number 20. A few days after the attack, several newspapers, as well as FBI, reported that a paper passport had been found in the ruins of the World Trade Center. In August 2004, CNN reported that the 9-11 hijackers, Zayed Jaraz, Vida was found in the remains of Flight 93, which went down in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. At least a third of the World Trade Center victims' bodies were vaporized, and many of the victims of the Pentagon incident were burned beyond recognition. And yet, visas and paper passports which identify the perpetrators and back up the official versions of the events miraculously survived explosions and fires that we are told melted steel buildings. Well, Charlie, I can't say it hasn't been interesting. As I said earlier, you showed up today, focused, organized. Regardless how I feel about the material you presented, I must commend your dedication and zeal. However, our time is up. Mr. President, one more second. Mr. President, I implore you, based on evidence you now possess, to use your executive power. Prove to us all, sir, that you do, in fact, care. Create a truly comprehensive and open congressional investigation of 9-11 in its aftermath. The families deserve the truth. The American people and the rest of the free world deserve the truth, Mr. President. Make sure you're on the right side of history. I am on the right side of history. Thank you, Charlie. My staff and I will be in touch. May I mumble dog face to the banana patch? <laughs>